This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I'm Andrew, the security guy. This is another episode of Security Matters Hawaii. Today we're going to be talking about security, privacy, identity, consent, kind of where all this stuff uh, intersects uh, in this country and sort of what's driving it. Uh, we've got one of the experts here who was a featured speaker last week at GSX uh, conference, the big security conference we just had in Las Vegas. Uh, nationally attended, Sal Diagostino is with us from uh, Open Consent and ID Machines and a lot of the things that he runs. Sal, welcome, welcome. Uh, Sal's remote, he's not in the studio with me, but uh, he's online with us. Aloha, brother, welcome, welcome aboard. Uh, aloha, Andrew, good to be back on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much. You know, we, um, this, this topic in particular is sort of, ev I don't know if it's evasive, but I think people don't like to spend the hard time thinking about it. So I thought we'd start with a few definitions, uh, you know, to kind of clarify where the discussion is going to come from. But the first thing I do with my guests is put them on the spot just a little. And, you know, you're a longtime security professional. Tell me what keeps you up at night. Um, well, a whole range of things, but on this particular <laughs> topic is the fact that uh, you know, there's just been an explosion of uh, sensitive information about people, places, and things that, uh, that's gotten out there into the world. Um, some by people not knowing they were doing it, others by people taking it because you know, people weren't careful about where they had it. Mm. Um, and, and then on top of that, so the thing that really scares me is then people actually are data hoarders. Ah. And it's pretty hard to do security and privacy if people just hoard and don't know how to uh, you know, clean out the closet when it comes to their personal information. You know, I mean, it's, you know, you think about it. You keep file cabinets, hard drives, cloud, you know, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and security professionals and you know, are, are prone to those same inclinations. So as a security professional, the amount of uh, sensitive information that is required to deliver security services and the fact that it's seldom inventoried, like cards or card readers, mm. and managed, uh, <laughs> it keeps me, you know, that keeps me up at night. Um, it keeps me busy during the day, too. <laughs> nice. Um, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad that, that somebody and you yourself is working on it, you know, in particular. I know um, maybe we'll let's kick the ball just a little bit to some of these initiatives that, you know, you've been involved with Kantara Initiative and Open Consent and IDSG for years. Give us a little bit of that background, and then I think we'll get into how GDPR is pushing into us and some of these definitions we've been talking about for privacy and things like that. Yeah, I mean, so Andrew, we met when I was working on the, the two, early 2000s when there was uh, something called the personal identity verification yep. uh, you know, credential and standard that was developed for the U.S. government for its trying to do high assurance stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, and, and I was you know, at that time, the company I was involved with helped us solve some problems to make all of that work and you know we did a lot of work there and that was you know and I thought that was a pretty good thing right I mean there you had something which was really vetted identity protected cryptographically with a hard token to use the lingo mm -hmm. um, had multi-factor authentication available including biometrics which is handled securely um, but it was just a hard thing to use with a lot of machines and technology that's out there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and what won over that was just the ease of use of getting online and doing mobile and downloading the app and away you go. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah, and so the work, from the, you know, the work from there then progressed into something that was an initiative you know, about you know, six, seven years ago. Um, which was called the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. And obviously, you know, I'd been involved in the work with the PIB credential and the digital certificates that are the background of that and the public key infrastructure behind that, which drives a lot of, you know, in other countries and other places, national ID programs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was clear we had an identity issues <laughs> in the United States. You know, we still do to sure. this day. Um, a national ID is not an option here for a number of reasons. 
So that was a public-private partnership to put together a strategy around that. And that, I mean, and that's that's gone. You know, that 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 was funded by the Department of Commerce and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, it was a, a multi-year grant. In the process of doing that, we put together something called an ID framework. Um, and also a registry for identity services. And underlying the framework is the fact that we, you know, there were some principles that were established mm -hmm. around what it means to do online identity right. And then when it comes to how to measure that, the way to measure that is how well you're doing on usability because you got to start there. Um, privacy because that was, that was one of the guiding principles. And then of course the stuff that, you know, more more often is recognized would be security, and then it needs to be interoperable. If it was going to sort of work across the okay. population. Each of those things are a challenge. the The interesting thing was that by having tackled the usability and privacy stuff there, um, I, I, because this, personally as a security professional, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of what we do is getting people to do the way you should do it. It's, you, know, you don't have to invent anything, honestly, in terms of um, you know, how, to, how to do access control. Um, mm -hmm. there, I mean, unless you want to get fancy, but you know, that's a whole separate topic. Um, but but how, to do usable, you know, how to do security where you, you, you take into account usability and privacy, I mean, that was, that was an interesting thing. So, you know, so the IDSG and the IDF registry still Still exist. They've been now moved into the Cantara Initiative, which is something another trade organization that I've spent some time and am currently involved with it in you know in a, in a leadership role as well um, as the secretary of its leadership council. And and I've been involved in a number of sort of like uh, you know as you know I, I play I spent a lot of time over the horizon, Andrew. Uh, so uh, there <laughs> there there are initiatives on things which are called user managed access, which is a mm. A, a, a distributed access control protocol, which is a really interesting thing, and harkens back to the work I we did, was involved with at Core Street around Pivman okay. and the way. Okay. Yeah, you know that. You know, I mean, you know that particular body of work, and that was you know, how to do access control without having to phone home and, yeah. and make an endpoint capable of doing it on its own. Um, and when you try to do things at scale, you got to do things in a distributed way. And yeah. Um, anyway, so there, there, I found other kindred spirits working on this user managed access protocol and it's pretty well established now. Um, it's in version two, there's implementations on that. I mean, that's about eight, eight or more, uh, gosh, I'm not sure how long, in the cooking. Um, but yeah, but that's been a fun thing. Um, the, a lot of the work at Open Consent um, is, is, is also found a sympathetic place in Cantara around um, some consent management work that's going on there, and a consent receipt, and, mm -hmm. and we'll talk more about yeah. the idea of receipts for you know what's going on with your information, as opposed to uh, simply clicking a privacy policy <laughs> and saying goodbye. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so. Let's let's, let's kind of go there with those 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 definitions a little bit. So you know, I agree. You know, as soon as you click that, I agree. All the stuff that you're ever going to do that you just agreed to. Like you said, there's people probably hoarding the activity associated with that, whether it's your name information, maybe it's other browser information. There's no telling what you're doing when you interact with that. And you've probably just consented for them to do whatever they wish. If you're uh, signing, ter signing terms and conditions mm -hmm. is not the same as consenting to something, right? Okay. I mean, but, you know, so, and that's the difference. So what, you know, privacy policies and, the, and end user licenses mm -hmm. are, are not really have been that usable from a privacy perspective, right? Because they're, it, whatever is going on is obfuscated, right? It's hard, you're like, what? Yeah. You know, I'm going to click it because, you, know, you know, I'll be here a long time, and even after I read it, I'm going to have to go figure out what it is I just read. Yeah. Um, so, that, you know, so, and that, so that's not usable. Um, and, and nor is it driven with the idea of consent by design. So, you know, security by design is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Privacy by design is a good thing. Um, more and more, you know. I mean, I think in one of the one of the design principles of privacy by design is consent by design, because if you use that in terms of how you then structure things, um, it also makes it harder to hoard, right? So all these things might go back to the, our newfound what keep us awake at night and the, and the you know the 
Porter as an organizing principle around this conversation, right? So, you know, if people aren't going to want you to hoard their stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if you put, so it's a little different if you think of the, you know, the workflow that you go through um, to get to the point where you're willing to share information about yourself or conduct transactions. Um, it, 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 there, there are ways to improve that, right? And, there, and so, you know, that, that's a lot about what operational privacy is about. And, it, and, and what you can do in the course of improving it is help people help themselves and that's where the operational aspect comes mm -hmm. in. That's where the service level aspect comes in. You know, as opposed to really have gotten, have, having gotten very little. I mean, a good example, you know, I mean, the, is simply having a name and a contact uh, with the privacy policy. Look at the privacy policies you read, right? Mm -hmm. Click here, this is that, you know, we take care of you. Here's a website to go to. Not, you know, if you have a problem, come and talk to me, mm -hmm. right? Which is, you know, if you're providing someone a service, Andrew, in your business, you know, you're, you're not going to forget at some point in, in, during the introduction to say, you, can, you know, if there's a problem here, you can always talk to me. And, and very few of us ever get that kind of, you know, service, you know, when we're dealing with um, <laughs> the next app. Yeah, and especially the embedded stuff. I saw that uh, Google just said the next issuance of Chrome, there's going to be a whole lot more scrutiny on the... Um, uh, embedded uh, other widgets that you can embed into Chrome because those have been harvesting all this information which they just allowed. It was like um, open privilege. Like they were just they were just allowed to take information from Chrome to use oh, it. it. And like, wow, what's up with that? People don't know this. It's all transparent. Yeah, I mean, if, I mean, if you don't use a, uh, uh, you know, a privacy plugin on your browser like Ghostery or um, Privacy Badger. I mean, there's a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. um, they light up yeah. when you <laughs> when you get these places, right? And um, yeah, it's. You, I mean, it's 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 a good way to understand how your stuff is being harvested. And that again, that's the usable privacy thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, the the green lock kind of means that you've got a secure connection. I mean, we know that. Yeah, it's not bad, honestly. You know, it's come a long way and. Yeah, up until recently, most people didn't require that you communicated with, mm -hmm. you know, websites or suggest that websites be HTTPS again to be geeky, right? Um, but the secure connection as opposed to an insecure one. Yep. Um, yeah, you, the same sort of simple, simple presentation of privacy status also needs to be something that is part and parcel of what you know what we think useful privacy is and. Um, yeah, and in the IDSG, we had 15 things where we put together, it was like, you know, here's a 15-item privacy checklist, it's pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Open Consent's got, you know, got, has, got, has developed a whole schema around that, um, you know, taking those 15 and <laughs> going a little deeper. Um, but, uh, you know, but to the point, though, because, yeah, I mean, but, the, but we don't represent the, you know, like, we don't show a, a, our schema or our way of evaluating and measuring um, you know, privacy or consent to people. We, we show them something which has a, the same kind of graphic representation, which is a few things that are checked, and you know, you're doing a pretty good job here. And, uh, mm -hmm. and with the idea that if you could, what you should be doing is presenting people with something that they can click on to, to figure out, you know, you know, establish what their current relationship is, uh, you know, understand you know, what your public privacy mm -hmm. profile looks like, um, be able to get in touch with you, um, be able to get a status on the type of information you'll be sharing. I mean, those are things that, I mean, if you look at the new California laws, you know, which you know, I think there's half a million businesses in California, so it'll impact some people. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're suddenly seeing California companies rush to get the federal government to bail them out. Mm -hmm. with, oh, we want privacy legislation. The guy, you know, suddenly they've got religion because California... Um, put something down with some teeth and, and with where individuals have rights. Awesome. Um, yeah, and so that you mean, and, and, you know, and that's been happening globally, right? I mean, sure. like, you know, there's the general data protection regulation, which, you know, is, you know, kicked in this year, even though it was passed two years ago, which covers, you know, you know hundreds of millions of people in Europe. Sure. Uh, and their data wherever that goes. 
Um, you've got you know, the local. The, you know, you've got Canada later this year. India just passed legislation. So I mean, you're talking about billions of people who, and 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 yeah, and and millions and millions of companies um, who are confronting um, a new set of rights that they have to respect. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and provide services which are considerate of those. So yeah. the, idea, the idea that you need to figure out how to make this operational um, matters because you know, people, you know, people have the right to ask questions. And you know, Again, if your customers are asking you for stuff, it's better to have an answer, better to make it so easy for them mm -hmm. that they can answer the question themselves. And that's, that's a lot of what we yeah, that kind of yeah, as you know in the IDOLA platform in the previous conversation we had at Think Tech Hawaii, our whole focus there at ID Machines was to help cut across the, the knowledge and, and complexity gap around cybersecurity. At Open Consent we're trying to do the same thing when it comes to privacy. Awesome. So let's take a break, we'll pay some bills and uh, we'll be right back and I think we'll get into a little bit of what what the implications are for the future. What can what can we expect to see? We'll be right back. Sounds good, Andrew. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Aloha, I'm Marsha Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us, aloha. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. This is Security Matters Hawaii, where we're with Sal D'Agostino, and we're talking about security, privacy. We want to know where it's going, because Sal's got that kind of vision, but Sal, maybe to know where it's going, we got to talk about where it started. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, good, always good to look at things from a historical <laughs> perspective and be able to understand the thing that you're talking about. Probably didn't show up you know, today, and you figured it out and one fell asleep. Never happens so. for me that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not usually on this end. Um, I mean, you break down the word, it's an interesting thing. It's, it, it's, it goes back to like, yeah, in France, in fact, there were private laws, right? So, you know, to be, to, so for the aristocracy, there were different rules than for everyone else. Oh. And so literally, so initially, Privacy was very specifically to 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 set set up the rights of the rich. Oh. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, back when, right? It's like for as an example, there was a law, you know, specific. The private law in France said that the aristocracy didn't have to pay taxes. They gave, you know, they got the church, um, you know, bonus card there. Uh, with, wow. You know, um, so. Yeah, and but then so that's so it's interesting to understand that, and then so as so we're then talking about privacy as we begin to think about it, where it's sort of again in the United States it also started um, with protecting the fairly well-to-do, hmm. um, and comes into play around the time that instantaneous photography begins to have an impact, and I forget which president's hmm. fiance someone took pictures of, oh. which. I, and I think her last name was Palmer, you know, so I should have written this down before we came on today, knowing we might go there. But, uh, you know, that, that, would, that happened. And then, in eight, you know, and then the thing everybody will tell you about is in 1890, the Harvard Law Review, um, you know, the, the right to privacy was, was written up as a thing. Hmm. And, oh, it's a, yeah, that's not that long ago, right? I mean, it's yeah, 130, it's, yeah. 130 years, roughly. Um, where the, it became something which, even though at that point it was written up because of this uh, um, 
invasion of the uh, of the of the living rooms and you know bed slash bedrooms of the elite. Um, it became something which then got out and began to be thought of you know you know as a right of human yeah, beings. publicly, and, sure, makes sense. And so so and then it take you know then it took a while. Um, and then it's gone through a whole bunch of sort of interesting uh, twists and turns since then. Um, you know, I mean, from an identity perspective, the whole Social Security Administration was kind of an interesting mm. phase, which was in the 1930s. Um, you know, we're talking a lot of what we're talking about today is identity theft. Mm -hmm. um, early on, the Social Security Board, as it was called, was extremely protective of people's personal information. Mm. So a lot of where it, of the, the sort of the practice around how to handle personal information if you think about it, a lot of the government regulations on how they handle information because government security controls do cover security and privacy mm -hmm. um, as as this basis and how the what was called the social security board um, treated that info and they would early on they would not even give it to other government agencies even okay. law enforcement and, you know, and but then uh, then at some point that broke down because you know there's a pretty you know, life, life or death kind of case, and then ever since then, um, hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Or something. So um, we, we lost our point. way. We lost our way a little bit. It sounds like they initially understood the power of identity protection and what it meant, and then it got they, coerced they a little bit. They understood the need to protect, protect personally identifiable yeah. information. So PII is a term that you know, you know, in this field, you know, is is, is the you know the the thing where security and privacy overlap, intersect, right? Intersect, yeah, for sure. I mean that is the intersection. So uh, I mean I, sometimes I, I like to talk about it, sensitive information. PII is a kind of sensitive information. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, in the enterprise where you're looking at information risk, um, having it and killing two birds with one stone. Um, mm -hmm. so you don't look it for a different kind of information. Just sort of think about what's sensitive. And then, and then when you apply the controls, they're either privacy controls or security controls. I mean, that's what the sort of the how too. Mm -hmm. sure. But the social security thing was funny. I mean, there are people that had tattoos because they didn't want to lose it, right? You know I mean, because yeah, you know, at least when I'm 62, if I die, if I got my social security number, I'm good. And back then, that was almost enough to get by, wow. right? So okay, um, interesting. And then other companies were marketing your social security rings. You know, you could get a little bling with your number on it. Wow. And, uh, interesting. Um, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, I know. So and so then it kind of flipped at one point, Andrew. It's like uh, suddenly it was it was out, and as I said, the genie was out of the bottle. Um, and then you know, you know, all the way to you know current times where uh, you know, as I you know, the thing that kept me up at night is just the proliferation of information and devices. And you know, as a security professional, you know, the amount of bits that are traveling around in the network are certainly you know growing astronomically. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't you know it doesn't yeah, and, and and at some point that information is going to get connected to people, and there's risk around it, right? I was, so that's the. I was thinking as you talk, as you just, you just this picture came in my mind, you know, that with enough machine learning, um, an individual's habits, you'll know, you from their habits, you'll be able to derive the individual. Oh yeah. Without no, knowing anything about them or who they are, and then from there it'll be pretty easy to figure out really who they are. Well, yeah, I mean, the social graph that, that people get from the amount of information that they've let out and after they do a little bit online is probably strong. I don't know this, you know, just, uh, but yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if it's stronger than some of the, you know, the hard security keys. <laughs> like your thumbprint? <laughs> your and user terms, print might be more, you know, accurate. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, in terms of, and so I think, I mean, and that's, so that kind of leads us me into an interesting point, which is where, uh, yeah, you know, in the old days it used to be authentication and then author. Well, in the old days, I, yeah, I'm thinking that we've already evolved. So uh, because of, this is what I'm working on. <laughs> yeah, I built, I built the I built the things where you authenticate and then authorize. Right, mm -hmm. we all have. That's how we do stuff. Um, I, I think really what's the, what's what's happening now is we're going to look going to be in a situation which you have consent, literally replacing authorization because it's not going to be a question of who it is because you. You know, as I said, it's not hard to hide. Um, okay. Or, or, or even better would be things that are designed where you don't even need to identify, right? Mm -hmm. So, sure. Because why? 
So, and so for both of those reasons, if authentication is less of a requirement to get to access control or the authorization of the use of assets, then that's really an, you know, that's an interesting thing. And a lot of what we're working on now at Open Consent are the concept of, you know, of the of, 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 of tokens and receipts associated with, or, or actually you know, tokens can be in the receipts even, okay. um, to accomplish those sorts of things, right? So, um, yeah, and, 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 in, and in some ways what you're doing is that you're sort of supplanting the role with the right. Okay. Um, right? I mean, yeah. so that, you know, typically in order for me to do something, you know, on a valid credential and I had to know how to do swift water rescue before someone was going to put me in a boat as opposed to, you know, helping in the medical tent. Sure. Um, and yeah, but so, but now really, what you you could almost craft that differently to say the you know, the the yeah. I'm I'm, I'm I, I have consented to be able to access the information mm -hmm. for those particular roles, right? Or, sure. or I have people have given me their consent to sure. be able to, do this. or um, yeah, I've requested. The role of this, and then I, you know, and then I've been granted that. But mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's it, I mean, I think it's going to be a big difference in terms of how we go about designing and, and building the user interactions. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we can, I think we can definitely take this, this, all this authentication, all this stuff that's happening transparently without our knowledge. Right? We've got to eliminate that so that. If you ask me for information and I share with you just the information that's required, maybe it's a token, maybe there's no information you can even read, but you, you're sure that it's me, you got my consent to do with this what you said you would, and I got, a, uh, as you said, a receipt for that, there's a lot more uh, transparency in us knowing what we're doing with each other than, than what's going on today where no one really knows what they're giving away and, and what's being done with it. Yeah, I mean, today, I mean, these days when we're talking about it, what, what, what's not maintained is the state of privacy that you would like. Yeah. Right? And what, what, we're, what a lot of what we're designing are sort of these, these machines that describe and enforce a certain state. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, and that, that's, that's kind of the current engineering challenge and you know, some of the things we're actually in the process of building, um, you know, at Open Consent. Other pe other people are, you know, looking to do that too, awesome. right? Um, and yeah, it's it's fun. You know, it's like it's like a you know, it's it's nice to be onto a, a next cool thing that kind of combines a bunch of this other stuff. Um, yeah, All right. you know, because it doesn't stop, Andrew. Right? No, it's not going to stop. Sal, thank you so much for coming on today and shining some light on this for us. It's a I think it's an odd topic for people, and it, it, it's something that, that's going to just keep driving into, especially with, like you said, the California law. Everybody's going to have to become aware. It's kind of the next security battleground, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're going to manage risk, you've got to manage privacy risk, and if you're going to manage it, you might as well figure out a way to make it as easy and even turn it into value for you and the people that you interact with. Yeah, imagine that, people. Imagine you, your, value, your information, your identity being valuable to you instead of everybody else. Are you right. getting some of the value back for it? Sal, yeah. thank you so much. We are out of time today. Thank you for joining us on Security Matters Hawaii. Join us next week, uh, 1 o'clock Hawaii time. And, um, you know, we will share more of this great information with you because security matters. Thank you. Mahalo, Andrew. Aloha.